So UFC 285 Jones versus Garner is going to be taking place this weekend and I am very, very excited for the card. I will be doing a live stream, a full card companion live stream if you do want to hang out with me while I watch this amazing card. I've also actually pre-ordered the signed autographed poster for this card as well, which is going to go right there with my signed Artem Lobov printers. I'm going to put it there. I think it's going to be awesome and it's going to be kind of a cool little background piece <laughs> for my channel. As always though, if you want to have a little bit more money to play around with, you do have my BetUS link, which is just kind of there below. 125% sign up bonus, so you sign up using that link, and then you use that little code that's in there as well in my description. You'll get a 125% sign up bonus, but let's not waste any time. Let's get straight into it. It is worth noting as well though that I do have from Big Marcel himself, Esteban Rilovich has found himself a short notice opponent. Unfortunately, it just hasn't been announced yet, so maybe by the time that this video is out, the fight has been announced, I'm going to miss it. But anyway, for now, the first fight of the night is by Farid Basharat and Damon Blackshear. Should be a good scrap. Damon Blackshear made a somewhat short-notice debut against Yusuf Zalal, and um, he was winning the fight, really, and then Yusuf Zalal really came back, got a 10-8 in the, in the third round after Damon Blackshear completely gassed out, probably because of the short-notice nature of the fight, though, to be fair. And Fareed Basharat, very, very heavy favorite. I was very surprised when I saw this line. Minus 450 is probably a little bit wide for this one here, considering Damon Black, she was looking pretty good against Yusuf Zalal before um, before uh, the, the end of the fight, really, when he gassed out. Fareed Basharat, he won his Dana White's contender series fight. It is worth noting that Alan Bogoso took that fight on short notice himself, and he does have actually some pretty decent wins on the regional scene as well before that Dana White's contender series debut. Fareed does fight with a pretty similar style to his brother. I mean, obviously, they do train together. They're at Extreme Couture. They've got very good kickboxing as well as grappling and wrestling. Damon Blackshear, I think that his best game, the best uh, path to victory for him, is in the grappling. It would be pretty difficult to kind of take down Fareed Basharat and try and outgrapple him, though, which is why I do have Fareed Basharat to win this fight. I think he's going to get a decision. I think he's going to um, go the distance with Damon Blackshear. Maybe he could get a late finish if Damon Blackshear does gas out like he did against Yusuf Zalal. But I am going to think for now, with the evidence that I've seen from his fights, I think that really was just because of the short notice nature of the fight. I think he would have worked on the cardio by now. But I do have Fareed Basharat to win a decision in the first fight of the night. Jessica Pene taking on Tabitha Ricci. This is just a, a tough fight to call, really, but at the end of the day, Jessica Pene is 40 years old. She hasn't looked amazing. I know she actually has won a couple of fights, but she looked pretty bad against Emily Ducote. Kind of got pieced up a little bit there. And then Emily Ducote just fought Angela Hill and looked like she had absolutely no idea what she was doing on the feet. It was a bit of a weird situation there. But before that, she did beat Carolina Kolkavich, which was a year and a half ago. Before that, she beat Lupe Godinez by that split decision. But, um... I do have Tabitha Ritchie in this one here. I think at this point we could see Tabitha Ritchie look to use her grappling, which is probably her best based. But I do know that Jessica Penny as well has very good jiu-jitsu and grappling herself. I think this is a fight that would probably take place on the ground or at least um, up against the cage. I do think Tabitha Ritchie wins a decision. It's not really a fight that I'm super, super excited about, but I do think Tabitha Ritchie should win this one here. Maybe Jessica Penny could make something happen, but... I think the fight definitely goes the distance, and I think that Richie is going to be the one that is going to win their decision. Moving on, we've got Mana Martinez taking on Cameron Simon. This is a very good matchup for Cameron Simon, in my opinion. I think he's going to look to grapple with Mana Martinez. Mana Martinez is a guy who has really good KO power. You just wouldn't believe it if, you've, if you haven't seen his UFC fights. He knocked out Jose Johnson in 30 seconds, who was actually meant to fight last weekend. He knocked out a guy in a minute called Casey Jones. He knocked out this guy in, in a minute into the second round. First round KOs all through his career as well. But this is a guy with KO power and is dangerous on the feet. But we just haven't seen that KO in the UFC just yet. Cameron Simon is a guy that has been looking very good. He just fought Stephen Coslow, which was a very good grappling fight. I know it finished on the feet. But the fight was very, very heavily contested on the ground. A lot of uh, submission attempts, a lot of reversals, a lot of grappling moments in that fight. And Cameron Simon looked like a very good grappler. He showed very high-level grappling in that fight, in my opinion. And before that, he beat up Josh Wayne Kim in the grappling and also in the striking as well. He knocked him out. And Josh Wayne Kim is not your, your ordinary 5-1 guy. He was like 18-1 as an amateur, very highly touted, even trained with Alexander Volkanovsky for a bit. But I do think that Cameron Simon wins this one. I've got Cameron Simon by submission. 
in this matchup here. I don't think he's going to stand and trade with Mana Martinez. I know we did just see him fight to a close fight with Brandon Davis. I know that he has lost to Ronnie Lawrence, and that's where I think is definitely the path to victory against Mana Martinez. You want to take this guy down, and you want to grapple him. We've seen Mana Martinez struggle in the wrestling before against Ronnie Lawrence, who is very, very good. I think Cameron Saiman looks to use that game plan. I don't think he's going to try and stand and trade with Mana Martinez. I think he's going to take down Mana Martinez and find a submission in this matchup here. Cameron Saiman, if you do look through his career, most of it has been spent grappling. I know he only has one win by submission, but you do go through and you look at his EFC fights, which unfortunately are blocked behind a paywall. But a lot of them are spent on the ground. He does. He is a grappler. He is a wrestler for the most part. He's definitely developed everywhere. He's definitely very good everywhere. At only 22 years old as well. But I do think he's going to submit Mano Martinez. I just saw some really good grappling against Stephen Kozlo. And I think Cameron Saman's going to look to use that grappling over Mano Martinez. Where he's got a massive grappling advantage in my opinion. So I've got Simon Saman by submission. No one else does. But I guess let us see the KOs um, and Dana White's contender series in UFC and kind of assume that's going to happen. But I think he's going to take him down in this one here. In Machado, Gary taking on Kanon Song. Man, and Gary's a wide favorite. I kind of do understand. Kanon Song, though, isn't really a joke at all. Like, it's not like this guy hasn't been winning fights in the UFC. His UFC record is actually 4-2. and two. You know what I mean? But he does kind of have... A very fun style as well. He knocked out Kalan Potter, who, to be fair, isn't in the UFC anymore, but knocked him out in the first round. Got knocked out by Max Griffin in the first round, but we did see Max Griffin knock down Neil Magny, so you can't really blame him too much on that one there, but he is actually a very exciting fight. He's got a very exciting style as well. He has lost to Brad Riddell in the past, which is interesting too, but I do think N. Gary is going to win this one. He showed... He showed a, a pretty good level of fighting in his last fight. Like, when he fought Jordan Williams, he wasn't looking that great until he got the KO, and we we're kind of all like, hmm, is this guy really it? Like, is he is he really going to bring that kickboxing game that we saw in the Cage Warriors fights? So then he beat Darian Weeks, and it was a pretty close fight. It was somewhat competitive, and then he fought Gabe Green, and when he fought Gabe Green, he looked very good. He looked very good. I think he is going to beat Kanan Song. A lot of people don't like this matchup at all, uh, but I think that's actually a pretty fun fight. I think Kanan Song's got an exciting style. He's got UFC experience as well, which is um, which is always something to worth noting when, when guys are up and coming in the UFC like Ken Gary, fight an experienced fighter like Kanan Song. But at the end of the day, though, we have seen Kanan Song lose to lesser fighters than Ian Gary. I know it was in 2016, but he lost to a 10 and 6 opponent. Brad Riddell was 2 and 0 when he knocked him out, and. Um, I think we see Ingary beat him up on the feet by decision or knockout. We haven't seen Ingary get a knockout in a minute. Kanan Song has been knocked out before. I'm just going to go with Ingary by KO as well. I think he's actually going to find a shot like he has in Cage Warriors. He's got very good kickboxing. He showed a pretty good clinch game as well in a couple of his more recent fights as well. But I do think he's going to strike with Kanan Song. And I think he's going to find the KO. Julian Marquez taking on Mark andre Barriot. This is a very tough fight. But I am going with the power bar. Mark andre Barriot, Julian Marquez. This guy's an interesting case for me. You know what I mean? He's won a lot of fights in, 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 um, by submission, especially in the UFC. A lot of submissions in the UFC. Hasn't actually got a knockout since 2017, which is crazy because this guy's got so much power in the hands. The way that he fights is very exciting as well. He's kind of throwing leather and he's throwing down and then he kind of gets like a club and sub sort of situation is kind of how he tends to win his fights. But at the end of the day, though, where he did just see Julian Marquez take a beating against Gregory Rodriguez, it was a very long time ago, so I'm glad he took the time off. Marc Andre Barriot's also a very powerful guy. Is he as technical as a striker of Gregory Rodriguez? Definitely not. But he does also have a bit of wrestling in his background as well. He does also have a bit of striking as well. He's a very well rounded fighter. I think he should be able to beat Julian Marquez here. He did have a very tough fight against Anthony Hernandez, but to be fair, Anthony Hernandez is a tough fight for literally any unranked middleweight. Anthony Hernandez is a very nightmare matchup for a lot of these guys, to be honest. Mike andre Barriot, he did lose a lot of fights early on, but I do think he's coming to making a little bit of a comeback in a way. He did lose to Chidi and Jokwani by 16 second KO. A red flag when you're fighting a power puncher, a very powerful guy like Julian Marquez. But I think Mark andre Barriot should be able to get this one done. I think he's going to win a decision. I think he's going to wear on Julian Marquez and then, find a, and then find a decision win, especially based off the last two rounds. The first round will be competitive, and I think Mark andre Barriot will put on the pressure a little bit and win a decision. It seems like most people are going with Marquez, 
interesting. I mean, he's definitely live for a finish on either way, but I think Mark andre Barriot... Oh, man, I don't know. It's a weird fight. I do think Barriot's going to win it, though. I do have Marriott, even though he's a slight favorite as well. Maybe the line's going to flip. I mean, if 74% of people are picking Julian Marquez, maybe the line's going to fit and it flip, and we'll see um, Barriot as the underdog later on. Viviane Araujo taking on Amanda Ribas. I do have Amanda Ribas here. She is the slight favorite in the matchup as well. Viviane Araujo, she did actually just fight in a main event against Alexa Grasso, and Alexa Grasso is now getting a title shot off that win actually in the co-main event of this entire card. Amanda Ribas, I do believe she should be able to get the win over Viviane Araujo. Araujo is not a young fighter. She's 36 years old, which is not very young for a lot of women's uh, fighters. You tend to see a lot of women's fighters be younger than the men for some reason, but um, yeah, she's definitely not young. Amanda Ribas is the younger up-and-coming fighter. She did lose to Caitlin Chukagian, which you could argue that she won, who has been the number one ranked flyweight contender for a very long time. Verena Jandarova, she beat her, and now Jandarova seems to be uh, getting a couple of wins as well since then. She lost to Marina Rodriguez, got beaten up by her pretty bad, but to be fair, Marina Rodriguez is Marina Rodriguez. Beat Pan, Paige Van Zandt, Reina Marcos, but I do think she should be able to beat Viviana Araujo. I think Rebus is going to look on the grappling in this one here, and I think she's going to win a decision based off taking down Araujo, maybe getting some control time, working for some submissions, and I think she's going to win uh, by decision over Viviani. Araujo. Man, I'm yet to find an underdog, <laughs> but uh, I've got a couple coming up, you'll see. Uh, Derek Brunson versus Drikus Duplessis. I've got another favorite. I do have Drikus Duplessis in this matchup here. Derek Brunson. He's 39 years old. He's not the most athletic fighter in the world. And he is a pretty good wrestler as well. But aside from that, you know, he's not really impressing too much. I mean, I know he did beat Darren Till, but in hindsight, that win doesn't look all that good. I know Drikus Duplessis had a pretty tough fight against Darren Till in the second round specifically. He beat Kevin Holland, but Kevin Holland was then exposed by Marvin Vittori as well. He beat Emin Shabazian. Emin Shabazian then went on a losing streak after that. He beat Ian Heinish. Ian Heinish then went on, went on to lose as well. I mean, he did lose to Jared Cannonier and wasn't looking too bad in that fight, but I think in this one here, Drikus Duplessis is going to win. You know, the thing about Drikus Duplessis that a lot of people don't mention whatsoever, this guy has more submission wins than knockout wins, although he does have that crazy kickboxing background. He's a very good kickboxer, very good striker, but he's also a good grappler. In fact, I'm going to say he might even be an underrated grappler, just purely for the fact that no one talks about his grappling, no one talks about his submissions. A little thing about Drikus Duplessis is though his cardio isn't the best. I used to kind of think maybe his cardio was pretty good, but just the way that he fights and the way that he kind of goes all out in the first round and just doesn't really conserve his energy was the problem. I think it might be a combination of both. You know, he fought Darren Till, beat him up badly in the first round, to be fair, up against the cage, and was throwing, I think, like 60 strikes, I want to say, up against the cage. I can't remember the number. It was a crazy, crazy stat. Or maybe he threw 60 strikes in the first round, but anyway, he gassed out after the first round because he went crazy on Darren Till trying to get that first round finish and then Darren Till kind of came back a little bit in the second round and then eventually Drikus Duplessis was able to get the finish. When he fought Brad Tavares he did once again he didn't really gas out but he definitely slowed down a lot in the second and third round but you were able to see him still be able to push the pace although being so tired and that kind of does show that he is in very good condition. He beat Trevin Giles, he beat Marcus Perez and he also beat uh, Brendan Lesnar before he got into the UFC. Derek Brunson, this is a pretty big step up in competition for Drikus Duplessis. You can say that Derek Brunson is pretty highly ranked. Brunson's fought good guys, although they did go on to lose. He still did beat Darren Till himself. Drikus Duplessis just beat Darren Till. But um, yeah, I think that Drikus Duplessis beats up Derek Brunson on the feet. I think he's the much better striker. I hope he's working on that gas tank. Like he's taking short notice fights like this. He only fought two months ago. You know what I mean? Like, it's not really like a short notice fight, but it's not like you're giving him time in between fights to, to work on that gas tank, build up that cardio, this and that. I do think Derek Drikus Lupercy beats up Derek Brunson, though. He's going to have to defend quite a few takedowns because Derek Brunson is going to be looking to wrestle. But I think Drikus Lupercy, I think he's probably a good enough grappler to at least threaten something if he gets taken down. And also, I think he's a good enough striker to beat up Derek Brunson on the, on the feet as well. So I've got Duplessis to win. 
The method is a little bit unknown by now. I see Tapology picking mostly by KO, and to be fair, that probably is the most likely scenario. Duplicy by finish in general is probably pretty live. He could maybe get a submission on Brunson, and he could also win a decision by keeping the fight on the feet and just being the better striker. But I've got Drake's Duplicy for now. I think he should be able to get the job done. Cody Garbrandt taking on Trevin Jones. I do have Cody Garbrandt in this one. A lot of people seem to have Trevin Jones, which is a little bit interesting to me. I do think Cody Garbrandt should be able to beat Trevin Jones. Trevin Jones is taking this fight on short notice. He does have a little bit of a habit of taking fights on short notice. You know, I do believe he won his debut on short notice against Timur Valiev. And then he um, fought Tadro Jokub Kakramonov when he fought it, took him on on short notice. But I do think that... Um, Cody Garbrandt should win this fight. Like, he really should. I believe he's going to be the better fighter on the feet, and that's where the fight's going to take place. I know we did just see Trevin Jones get out-wrestled by Hayoni Barcelos, so maybe Cody Garbrandt could see that and try and use his own wrestling because he does have a little bit of a wrestling base. You don't see it much, but he does have wrestling in the back pocket if he needs to use it. But for the most part, Cody Garbrandt is a boxer, but the problem with Cody Garbrandt is because he's getting, he's getting knocked out, you know what I mean? And it's like... It's not really, the thing about Cody Garbrandt though, in my opinion, it's not really because he's got no chin, I think it's because he's got no striking defense. I think the fact against that he got knocked out by uh, Kaikara France probably was because of a chin issue, because he did cut so much weight, but his striking defense isn't that great, you know, like his, his striking defense just isn't incredible. It's kind of hard to trust Cody Garbrandt at this point, he's won one fight in about four and a half years. <laughs> I do think he should be able to beat Trevin Jones. I'm glad he's coming back up to 135. I don't think Cody Garbrandt's going to be a champion again. A little fun fact about Cody Garbrandt, though, just while we're getting off topic, is um, he was actually my first ever fighter that I really, really followed, and I really, really liked him. It was kind of around 2016. I started to notice who he was. I started watching UFC around, like, mid-2015. But when I found out who Cody Garbrandt was after he knocked out Thomas Almeida, I was like, I was sold on this guy, you know what I mean? And I thought... I even thought he was going to beat Dominic Cruz, um, but I was just kind of deluded. It wasn't because I was smart. I was like 14 years old, probably, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, I think uh, Cody Garbrandt does win this one. I think he's going to get back on the win streak, a win column. I hope that he just continues to take winnable fights. I don't want to see Cody Garbrandt fight power punches. You know what I mean? I think he should be able to beat Trevin Jones. Although Trevin Jones is live for a KO. I mean, he knocked out Timo Valiev. Um, but yeah, I, I think Garbrandt takes it, to be honest. Now we move on to the main card. I'm hyped for the main card. Before we get into the main card though, as always, I will be live streaming during this fight card. I will be live streaming throughout the whole card, prelims to main card. If you want to watch the event with me, I'll be prov I can't speak English. I'll be providing commentary as well as we'll be talking the fights. We'll be having a good time. I'm looking forward to it. But we've got Bonacore making his a very well anticipated debut. And I think he's going to win in the first round over Jamie Pickett. The thing about Jamie Pickett is he presents absolutely no danger to Bonacool. You know what I mean? It's not like he's going to go out there and knock out Bonacool. Jamie Pickett's whole style is kind of clinch you up against the cage and then grind on you against the cage to win a decision. That's kind of what he does. I know he does have a finish recently over... Oh, he doesn't have a finish recently. Wow. Okay, I was thinking of the Joseph Holmes fight, but he didn't even finish Joseph Holmes. My bad. He hasn't got a finish since 2020. His whole style does revolve around grinding you up against the cage, trying to close the distance and grind you up against the cage, although he does have a pretty good reach advantage in this matchup. I think Bonacool is just going to take him down and sub him <laughs> early and quickly. I don't think Bonacool is going to waste time on the feet. I think he's going to go for a takedown. I think he's just going to sub him. Um, just like that, really. Maybe even a ground and pound TKO. I don't think Bonacool's going to waste time on the feet. Jamie Pickett's not a bad striker at all. I wouldn't say that he's a great striker, but we haven't seen much from Bonacool in general, though. The thing about Bonacool is he's looked so good. We just haven't seen him tested at all. Like, he knocked down John Donovan Beard super early and finished him. He out-wrestled Zach Varego easily, subbed him, you know what I mean? And uh, he, he's, having good, um, he's having good grappling experience as well. In these events as well, knocked out John Noland, who was making his debut, knocked him out in 33 seconds. Like, this guy, his total fight time is like two and a half minutes as a professional. You know what I mean? Like, we don't really know what does Bonacool look like in the second round? What does he look like in the third round? What does he look like if someone hurts him on the feet? All these questions, they're not going to be answered in this fight. I think he's going to dominate Jamie, Jamie Pickett, take him down, sell them, knock him out maybe with a ground and pound. His grappling as well is so good. Like, the thing about Bonacool is he's obviously a great wrestler and he's got that great wrestling background. 
that everyone always goes on about, but his grappling is so slick. The way that he quickly transitioned into that triangle choke against Donna Van Beard is super, super impressive to me, and the confidence he had in his grappling to do that as well is amazing. You know, he's got really good grappling, and he's fast. The speed of this guy is unreal. He's so fast. When he was wrestling Zach Brago and grappling with Zach Brago, he was just moving so quickly. His wrestling was so fast. It was so fluid. It was so natural, and I think he's just going to take down Jamie Pickett easily, wrestle Jamie Pickett, and get a submission or an or a ground and pound TKO. Let's move on. Mateus Gamrot versus Yalom Turner. I said I have an underdog on the card. It did take until the 10th fight to find it. Oh, voice crack, awesome. But um, I've got Yalom Turner as an underdog in this matchup. He is the guy that has had the full camp. Mateus Gamrot is obviously a very good wrestler pure wrestling he probably is actually one of the best pure wrestlers in the lightweight division for sure his wrestling is great his offensive wrestling is great um but i do think that yalan turner is gonna beat him the thing is though with yalan turner i'm gonna be honest there isn't a lot of evidence to suggest that he can beat someone the level of mateus gamrot because although yalan turner is super high ranked i think he's ranked number 10 you look at his wins though brad riddell not ranked, maybe even retired. Jenny Malaki, not ranked, fighting unranked guys, and he has actually lost to a, to, to a couple of unranked guys himself. Uros Medic has kind of made a comeback since that fight. Brock Weaver, a punching bag for the UFC at the end of the day, and Joshua Culliwell is a featherweight. So, yeah, Yalan Turner, although he's looking so, so good against um, co the competition, it's not the same competition Mateus Gamrod has been fighting, like Armin Saruki and Diego Fajaya. Jeremy Stevens, although, you know, Jeremy Stevens is Jeremy Stevens, but, um, you know what I mean, Benil Dariush as well, like, Benil Dariush is probably going to be fighting for a title if he beats, um, Charles Oliveira, but I do have Yalan Turner in the matchup, a lot of people don't really like it, but I do, I think he's gonna, I think he's gonna stun Mateus Gamron early on the feet, because that's just kind of what he does, he's so big and so powerful for 155 pounds, he's six foot three with a 75 inch reach, and he's huge for the division. It's amazing how, how how big he is for the division, really. And he's just got the power in the hands. And I'm kind of trusting on that because I know for a fact Mateus Gamrot is not going to waste any time on the feet with Yalan Turner. That is a bad idea. He's going to be trying to take down Yalan Turner. But even if he does, Yalan Turner's got pretty good wrestling himself. We haven't really seen it recently because he's getting quick finishes. But his wrestling's pretty good, as well as his grappling. He's got a really good jujitsu background himself. Really good jujitsu, really good solid submissions. He could be submitting, he could be going for submission attempts. All this and that, he's got four subs on his record. I think Yalan Turner is going to knock out Mateus Gamrot. I think that's his, uh, his, his path to victory. It's not necessarily his only path to victory, but it really is the path to victory that he's probably going to need to use. So I've got Yalan Turner in this matchup here against Mateus Gamrot, who's taking the fight on short notice. So shout out to Gamrot. I think Yalan Turner gets it done. I think he gets it done by KO as well. We move on to the next fight, the, uh, the the showcase fight for either of these two. Whoever wins this fight is definitely going to make a pretty big name for themselves, especially if their name is Shavkat Rachmanov. This is a huge opportunity for either guy to really boost their name value. Like We are talking about the featured fight on the main card of the John Jones return pay-per-view. Jeff Neal versus Shavkat Rachmanov is a huge fight, it's a big fight for both guys' careers, you know, if Jeff Neal wins this fight, he just beat the 16-0 Shavkat Rachmanov, and is, is probably in the in the line for, for one to two fights away from a title shot, Shavkat Rachmanov beats Jeff Neal, he's probably going to be in like the, the top five, he's going to be in the talks for title shots, he's going to be like one, maybe two fights away from a title shot himself, you don't know what's going to happen with, with, uh, with Shavkat here, but I do have Shavkat in the matchup, he's looked really good, I mean, he's 16-0, obviously. He's obviously looked good in his career. He beat Alex Oliveira and then Mikhail Pazirez. But then he beat Carlson Harris. And that win over Carlson Harris is kind of the one that I, th that I realized. This guy is super legit. I know he's been very hyped, potentially a little bit too hyped uh, for, for, the, for the time that it was because he hadn't really fought that level of competition until he fought Carlson Harris. And Carlson Harris is no joke of a fighter whatsoever. Carlson Harris is great. And then he beat Neil Magny. And the fight, to be fair, it did take him a few rounds. I believe it was the second round. He managed to get the uh, the win over Neil Magny. But he still beat up Neil Magny. Neil Magny's a great fighter. 
I think on the feet though, Jeff Neal, man, he's got that boxing. He's got really slick boxing. And he is going to be maybe live to, to land something on Shavkat Rachmanov. But at the end of the day, Shavkat Rachmanov is well-rounded everywhere. He's got that kickboxing. He's got that wrestling. He's got that grappling. He's got um, he's kind of got everything. You can really mix it all together if you're Shavkat. And I think what's going to happen here is Shavkat, he is going to play around on the feet. He's going to do his awesome techniques that we do get to see. But I think he is going to end up going for the takedowns and wrestling against Jeff Neal. I have Shavkat Rachmanov here. A little bit of a controversial one because I believe he's got a 100% finish rate on his whole on his whole career. I think it's going to go the distance though. I think he's going to be trying to submit Jeff Neal. I think he is going to be taking down Jeff Neal in this fight. But I think Jeff Neal, he's a good wrestler and grappler himself. I think he's going to be defending all the attempts. I've got Shavkat Rachmanov by decision, which is a very interesting call. But um, yeah, if, if Shavkat Rachmanov isn't able to work the submission... I do think he's going to go the distance. So I've got Rachmanov by decision or by submission. I think that's how he wins. I would be surprised if he knocked out uh, Jeff Neal on the feet, who did just beat up Vicente Luque. He did just beat Santiago Ponzinibbio by close decision, to be fair. He lost to Neil Magny himself. He lost to Stephen Thompson himself. Knocked out one of the greatest fighters of all time, <laughs> Mike Perry. But um, yeah, I've got Shavka. I do think he's going to be looking to use the wrestling and grappling in this one. But I do think he's going to go the distance with Jeff Neal. I do I do feel like that. But I, I think maybe if he gets a submission, it would be late, like second or third round. You know what I mean? But man, it's a good showcase for both guys. It really is. Valentina Shevchenko taking on Alexa Grasso. I think it's just free legacy for Valentina at this point. I mean, the thing about Valentina, if you want to beat Valentina, what you have to do is you've got to grapple her. And it is something that we um, have seen. You know, we've, we've seen uh, fighters take down Valentina Shevchenko. And have a lot of success. You just got to look at some of her more recent title defenses. Jennifer Meyer won a round against Valentina Shevchenko because she took her down. Tyler Santos went to a split decision. Some people think that she won the fight because she was using her wrestling and her grappling against Valentina Shevchenko. If you want to beat Shevchenko, you're not going to do it on the feet, especially if you are Alexa Grasso. I know Alexa Grasso has got very good boxing herself, but Valentina Shevchenko's got that crazy background in kickboxing and Muay Thai. She's got crazy good striking. She's very well-rounded. She does have pretty good grappling and wrestling herself, but for the most part, what makes Valentina Shevchenko so great is how good she is on the feet and how good her striking is. And I do expect her to be able to beat Alexa Grasso, especially on the feet. But I don't think she's going to get the finish. I think it's going to go five rounds. I think Valentina Shevchenko wins 50-45 decision on the feet. I'd much rather see Valentina Shevchenko maybe make a title defense in the future against Erin Blanchfield. Although Erin Blanchfield, very unproven fighter herself, Erin Blanchfield is a very good wrestler and she's kind of got the style that would give Valentina Shevchenko problems. I don't think Alexa Grasso has the style to give Shevchenko problems. I've got Shevchenko by decision in this matchup. I think she gets it done. And it goes the distance. The main event is here. I've been 50-50 on this uh, for so, so long. I've been saying maybe this, maybe that. I'm going to put my stamp on it. And what I what I predict, I'm going to have to just back it. I'm just going to have to choose it. It's none, none of me just saying... Oh, yeah, like, I think maybe John Jones wins, but Cyril Garn could win. I was like, oh, it's a 50-50 matchup, this and that. If I'm going to make a pick on this fight, I have to back it. I have to stick behind it, and I'm going to do that. I've made my prediction. I've thought long and long and hard about this one, and as much as I want John Jones to win, the pick for me is Cyril Garn. I do think Cyril Garn beats the the unbeatable the the greatest of all time in many people's eyes in john jones i do think that he's going to get it done um i know i know i know it's pretty crazy but if you look at john jones though recently i know he's been fighting at light heavyweight completely different weight class but it's also maybe a reason why Garn could win too because john jones he fought dominic reyes to decision spent pretty much the whole fight on the feet really couldn't really initiate um, and utilize his wrestling and grappling against dominic reyes and he had a big reach advantage in that fight as well because he's got an 84 and a half inch reach, which is crazy. But Dominic Reyes was still landing shots on him. Like, John Jones was throwing out his jab and Reyes was landing uppercuts on him. Like, it just doesn't really make sense, you know. And then he fought Thiago Santos. That was a close fight. I do think John Jones did win the fight, to be fair. He beat up Anthony Smith pretty easily, to be fair, but that is Anthony Smith. Um, he beat Ale uh, Alexander Gustafsson as well, but... He's been a lot of good guys, but the thing is, when we're talking about these great wins, we're not talking last year, we're not talking 2020, we're talking a few years ago, 
And um, especially the Thiago Santos and Dominic Reyes fights, a lot of people kind of do put a couple of red flags on, really. But at the end of the day... John Jones is moving up a weight class, and it's not just moving up from like 155 to 170 or 125 to 135. This is like 200 pounds, and he's probably going to weigh in at 265 pounds, 260 pounds, somewhere around that, because he's put on a lot of weight. He's put on a lot of muscle. He's put on a little bit of soft tissue as well, but for the most part, it's mostly muscle at the end of the day, and he's, got, he's a lot bigger. But um, I'm not really going into why I think Garn wins. I think Garn wins because John Jones hasn't really fought this size of competition, you know, the heavyweights now, John Jones hasn't done this before, and, um, man, the more I talk, the more I doubt my pick, this is my problem with this fight, I, I want to pick John Jones so bad, but the pick is gone, when I'm thinking to myself, and I'm looking at these fights, I am thinking gone, Cyril Garn, in my opinion, beat Francis Ngannou, uh, I think, I don't know, understand why people heavily disagree with that one too, that's a little bit of a weird one for me, in my opinion, Garn won the first two rounds clearly, and then he won the fifth round as well, pretty clearly, because Ngannou did absolutely nothing whatsoever in that fifth round, but he went out and he beat Taito Iwasa, I know Taito Iwasa did drop him, but he put on a pretty good striking striking display against Taito Iwasa, and on the feet, he's going to be the better striker over John Jones, I know John Jones is a very good wrestler and grappler, do I think he can get Cyril Garn down? He couldn't really get down Dominic Reyes. He was struggling in the wrestling a little bit against Diego Santos. Like I feel like at this point, when you're fighting someone like Cyril Garn, I think he's going to struggle to get the takedowns. And I think Garn's going to be preparing for him. I know Garn said that he doesn't really train for this and that, but it, but you could kind of look at it like this. Cyril Garn, in my opinion, beat Francis Ngannou without training then. You know what I mean? Now he's fighting John Jones. So I, I've got I've got Garn in the matchup. I think Garn is the better striker. I think he's going to look good on the feet. John Jones has not fought in this frame that he's got now. We don't know what John Jones is going to look like at heavyweight. He hasn't fought in three years. I've got Cyril Garn. Wow, that's a tough fight to call. It's a tough fight for me to say, but... i got Garn. I've got him. I've got Garn by decision. Man, I want John Jones to win so badly, though. I really do. I want John Jones to win. I want John Jones to win. And then I want John Jones to fight Stephen Mietchich. And then I want John Jones to fight whoever else. I want to see John Jones fight more. I just don't want to see him lose. I don't want to see John Jones lose, you know, because he, he's, he's undefeated. Like, he's 26 and 1. But you look at that one loss, he absolutely dominated the fight before the stoppage. Absolutely dominated him. It was unreal. Um, man, but he's just. I just think Garn wins. Well, wow. it's such a weird fight to call. It's such a weird fight for me to say because I'm like sitting here. I'm like, man. I said, like, I said, I'm gonna put my stamp on it, but I'm like, oh, I'm 50-50. <laughs> I got Garn. I got Garn. Garn's the pick. Garn by decision is the pick. I think he beats him up on the feet. I think he keeps the fight on the feet and wins by decision. And is the new champion. I would much, much rather John Jones win the fight because I think John Jones would add a lot of value to the sport. I think if he won. The pay-per-views would, would be pretty good for this card. The pay-per-views would be good for his next card, for his next fight against Stipe Mitch, which I'm assuming it would be maybe first week of July. International fight week would be crazy. But I think Garn wins, and then I think he does. I think he definitely keeps the fight on the feet. He's going to be preparing for the wrestling, preparing for the takedowns, and I think he's just going to beat John Jones up on the feet and just be the better, more fluid striker because he's got such great movement for this weight class. Whereas John Jones... He's got good movement too, but we haven't seen it at heavyweight. We just haven't, so that's the pick. Um, let me know what you think in the comments. I would love um, you guys to uh, subscribe to the channel as well. If you like the video, please do like the video. And if you want to leave a comment, please do leave a comment. I do try and reply to every comment, this and that. Let me know what you um, are, are trying, to, trying to think. Let me know if you agree, disagree with my picks, all this and that. But um, it's a good card, guys. It's going to be a great, great card. I'm really looking forward to it.